So we're in a series looking at the creed, this ancient statement of faith, and we've come up to the bit where it says, He is seated at the right hand of the Father, talking about Jesus. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and He will come to judge the living and the dead. Where do you think history is headed? Do you think history is headed any particular place? You hear how people talk about history. Uh, Quite often they they will say, uh, this person is on the wrong side of history. Or this person is on the right side of history. Or people will say, uh, history will not be kind to so-and-so. And And, uh, in all those situations, people are basically uh, pretending to know where history is going. They, They seem to have some kind of intuition that history is headed to a certain destination. And they are on the train towards that destination. And perhaps other people are not on the train towards that destination. But that's a funny view of history, actually. Um, If you take God out of the equation, why should history be headed anywhere? Why should we have this sense that uh, we are on a train, that there is a destination, whether good or bad? Why do we think in these terms? Why do we think history is headed such places? But we we definitely do. Uh, Martin Luther King once said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. It's a great phrase. You can tweet that out. Less than 140 characters. You can tweet that out. You can put that on your Facebook memes. The arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. And uh, Barack Obama actually loved that phrase so much, he had it woven into a rug in the Oval Office. So as president, every day, he was thinking the foundation of all his judgments as president of the free world, right? The, the foundation of, of all of that was to think that... There is uh, an arc of the universe, and it is bending towards history. It might take a long time to get there, but there will be a happily ever after. A lot of people resonate with that today. A lot lot of people think that history is headed in a certain direction. But do we have any right to think that history is going anywhere unless we come to this book, unless we come to the Bible? Uh, You might know that, that history really is a conflation of two words. His story. And the creed is actually all about that. The creed is basically saying there is a story that guarantees history. There is a story that's like, I don't know, Jesus is like the needle that kind of plunges down into the pit, into the grave clothes, into that black shroud of death. And Jesus comes out the other side. And what is history? Well, it it depends on whether you're connected to the needle, like thread. (laughs) Are you connected to this one who can actually plunge down into the blackness, into the darkness, into the pit, and actually have a future at the right hand of the Father? That's what the creed says. So Jesus takes this journey. He, He kind of goes down into death and comes up into life. There is an arc. There is a moral arc to his story. And that's why Christians have kind of thought, you know, history is like that. History follows his moral arc. And it does actually bend towards justice. It does end up with God and the happily ever after in the end. But you take away his story and what's left of history? Not a lot. There tend to be three views that people can take about history. And and you can think of them as shapes. Some people think of history as a circle. Some people think of it as a frown. Christians think of it as a smile. Those are the three shapes, okay? The the three shapes are circle, frown, smile, okay? And maybe one way of thinking about uh, history is to think about a day. When When do you think a day begins? When does a day begin? Now, there's a lot of people, certainly Eastern philosophy, would kind of frown at that question. What do you mean, when does a day begin? It's just night follows day, follows night, follows day, follows night. Where where does it begin? Where does it end? There is this infinite cycle, okay? So in the East, people tend to think of history as a cycle. It just goes round and around and around and around. And there is this cycle of birth and rebirth, samsara, they call it, okay? And so history is not an arrow. It's not headed any place. It just goes around and around and around and around. Now, if you think of history as a circle like that, what's your reaction to, to life going to be? You're not really going to want to engage with the ups and downs of history. 
Because history is not going anywhere, okay? It's a train that only just goes around and around and around and around. So who wants to get on that train? You want to disentangle yourself from life. You want to disengage. You want to detach from life if you think of history as a circle. Okay, so that's, that's the Eastern view. The Eastern view of history is life is a circle, history is a circle, and therefore you want to disengage from the ups and downs of life. And then a second view comes along, and uh, the second view, when it's asked the question, when does a day begin, the second view says, I know when a day begins. A day begins at midnight. Is that when you thought a day begins? Ever since Julius Caesar, that's when we've thought that a day begins. But isn't that interesting? Julius Caesar was the first person to sort of shift our understanding of a day. And he basically said, you know what? A day is a microcosm. A day preaches to you about what history is like. And you know what history is like, says Caesar? You begin in darkness. You enjoy your brief moment in the sun. And you plunge back down into darkness again, right? That's a day, right? And ever since Julius Caesar, even Christians, we go along with this quite often, right? It's not what it says in the Bible, but this is, this is how we think of a day, and it's often how we think of history. We think of history like a frown, right? We start in this prebiotic soup, right? And through a process of struggle and selfishness, we emerge into the daylight, and we try to enjoy our brief moment in the sun before we plunge back down into the compost heap. Isn't that, isn't that how we think of life? And uh, that's a big problem. Because that's, that's not a Christian way of looking at history. It's not a Christian way of looking at life. So, but I think, I think even in the church, I think even Christians, we kind of imbibe this view of the human personality. We think of ourselves as basically biological survival machines, right? Isn't that what we are? We are wet robots, biological survival machines, clinging to an insignificant rock, hurtling through a meaningless universe towards eternal extinction, you know, but Starbucks has a new flavored latte, so that's nice, isn't it, you know? <laughs> and uh, we're renovating the kitchen, so uh, that's something to look forward to, isn't it, you know? So here we are, we've, we've emerged from the slime, we're enjoying our brief moment in the sun, we know we're headed to the pit. And so we've got a few items on our bucket list to check off, right? And we, and we try to enjoy ourselves as best we can, knowing that we are biological survival machines clinging to an insignificant rock hurtling towards a meaningless extinction, right? <laughs> that's, that's life. That's the frown, okay? That's very much the frown. Okay, but Christians, we have this view of the moral arc of the universe bends towards justice. We've actually got a smiley face, Okay. We actually think that life begins where the day begins, okay? In the Bible, a day does not begin at midnight. On the first page of your Bible, it says, And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And there was evening, and there was morning the third day. When does a day begin in the Bible? In the Bible, a day begins at dusk. So that... Yes, we might begin in darkness. Remember that Genesis story. Remember, the Spirit of God is hovering over the waters. And there is darkness and there is emptiness and there is the deep. And then God said, the Word of God is proclaimed. And all of a sudden, let there be light. And light, light conquers darkness. That's a little microcosm. That's a little telling of, of history according to the Bible. Yes, we might be in the darkness now, but the light is coming. Yes, we might have plunged down into the valley, but in the future there will be feasting joy. Yes, there might be death, but we are headed towards the right hand of the Father. As it was with his story, so it will be with history. And I think a great place to see this shape to history is Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians 2, if you, if you don't know the Bible very well, uh, this is kind of Christianity 101. I, I love Philippians chapter 2. It boils all things down to its real essence. It's basically a song that people were singing in the first century. Uh, from within a few years of Jesus' life and death and resurrection, people were singing this song, and the Apostle Paul, who wrote half the New Testament, he writes it down, and he gives us a shape to his story, which is actually the shape of history. Philippians chapter 2 from verse 5. 
In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Did you notice the shape? It's a smile, isn't it? It's not the frown. It's not climb up and get in this world and then tumble down into tragedy. It's actually the shape of Jesus' life, which is to stoop, serve, suffer, sacrifice, and die for others, and then be raised up to the right hand of the Father. The creed is all about this. So you've been going through the Apostles' Creed, this ancient statement of faith, and, and it takes the same shape. Jesus is born of the Virgin Mary, so he comes down from heaven, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. Do you notice the shape? Down we go into the pit. Down we go into the dark valley. But on the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. So what it's saying is Jesus defines history, and the shape of his life defines the shape of all life. That's what it's meant to be. It's meant to be this, this smile. It's meant to be this going down into death and then rising up into life. And that's a, that's a wonderful thing. We Christians, we believe that the shape of history is the shape of life, and the shape of life is stoop, serve, suffer, sacrifice for others, and be raised up at the end. It's the difference between three kinds of play. Okay? Let, me, let me tell you three kinds of play that you could have. Okay? One kind of play, think of a tragicomedy. Okay? A tragic comedy was something that Samuel Beckett wrote. He wrote a, a play called Waiting for Godot. And it's, it's really this kind of nihilistic play. It's this nihilistic vision for life. You've got two guys waiting for a third character called Godot. Um, and of course, it's, it's an allegory for humanity waiting for God to show up, waiting for God to do anything, waiting for God to shape history the way we want him to shape history. And in the play, Godo never shows up. So all you've got is just people waiting for Godo. And most of the play is about them discussing suicide, discussing the meaninglessness of their lives. It's a tragic comedy, and, and there are jokes along the way, and there are moments of pain and anguish and heartache along the way, but really there's no meaning to it. And at the end of the play, uh, the, the, there's a boy who comes on and says, Oh, Godot, he'll, he'll be here tomorrow. Just, just hold on one more day. And of course, the two men, they don't really believe the boy because Godot just hasn't shown up. And this really is the tragic comedy. It's the circle. Life just goes round and around and around. And why not disengage? Why not detach? And in the play, the way that they talk about detaching is the ultimate way of detaching, of wanting to get off this merry-go-round for good. That's one kind of telling of history. It's the tragic comedy. Or another kind of telling of history is the tragedy. Okay, so think of uh, Dante. He, he wrote the Divine Comedy back in the, the Middle Ages, and, and he spoke of uh, a tragedy as a play that begins in joy and ends in pain. Begins in joy, ends in pain. The frowny face, okay? Think of Shakespeare, okay? Within Hamlet, uh, Hamlet is a tragedy. And that doesn't mean that Hamlet's not full of jokes. There are lots of jokes in Hamlet, apparently. Um, your English teacher probably had to point them out to you. They, my English teacher had to point out to me, you know, at this point, Hamlet is telling a joke. And uh, I wrote down in my exercise book, at this point, Hamlet is telling a joke. And, you know, apparently, you know, and you put it in, the, in, in your exam and, and you pass. But, you know, there are moments of levity within these tragedies. But at the end of Hamlet, how does it end? Funerals everywhere, dead bodies everywhere. The, st the stage is just heaving with the, with the bodies of the dead, right? That's a tragedy, and, and maybe that's the way that history is. You get up on top and you try to get all you can from life. You know, life then becomes about grasping, doesn't it? Life then becomes about getting all you can, climbing, taking, grabbing, scratching, killing, 
being all you can be for me. That's the tragic way of life. But then there's the third kind of life, the third kind of history. It's the comedy. Dante said that though a tragedy begins in joy and ends in pain, a comedy begins in pain and ends in joy, right? It's the smiley face. That you plunge down into a pit, but you are raised to a great height. Now, without Jesus, without his story, I don't see any reason why you can believe that history ends well. Without his story, I don't see how you can think that the moral arc of history bends towards justice. Why on earth should it? Without Jesus, you have to either live the, the circle, live the tragic comedy, live the waiting for Godot and detachment is your goal, or you have to live the tragedy You have to live the frowny face, climb up onto the hill and get all you can before plunging down. And then selfishness must rule your life. But what if this story is true? What what if the God of heaven has actually plunged into our tragedy, taken on our darkness, taken on our pit, and risen again to life? Wouldn't that be extraordinary? This is the wonderful possibility at the heart of the creed, the wonderful possibility at the heart of the Christian's view of life. Notice what happens in verse 6. Jesus Christ, being in very nature God, does not consider equality with God something to be grasped, something to be used to his own advantage. Isn't that interesting? Jesus, he was there before the world began. Do you know that about Jesus? A lot of people get this wrong about Jesus. They think that Jesus just came to invent a a religion. Jesus did not come to invent a religion. (laughs) Jesus invented the universe, okay? That's, that's the biblical view of Jesus, okay? There he was, full of the Holy Spirit, loved by the Father. He was at the Father's right hand, so to speak. We'll think about that in a second. There he was in the place of privilege and honor and blessing. He's in this Niagara Falls of love, the Father pouring out the, the spirit of love and adoration onto his head. And this, this is the divine reality. We are very much on high when we begin the Christian story. But then... How does Jesus think? He doesn't think according to the tragedy. He doesn't think that life is what you make it. He doesn't think in terms of grasping, grabbing, scratching, taking. What does he do with all that godness? There he is in very nature God. What does he do with all his godness? He pours it out. See, God is a fountain of life. But where do you see that life expressed? Well, where do you see a fountain expressed? You see a fountain expressed when it's poured out. Where do you see the life of God expressed? You see the life of God expressed in Jesus who pours himself out with every drop of his blood. What kind of God is this? This is interesting, don't you think? I don't know what kind of God you might have come to church with. Um, I, I think my default view of God growing up in the West is basically of some distant individual, high on power, low on personality, some kind of, you know figure on a throne with a beard, arms folded. Maybe he's got a thunderbolt ready to hurl. Um, my job is to go around the country and talk to people about God. And a lot of people say, don't, don't bother with God, Glenn. I don't believe in God. And my question is always, well, which God don't you believe in? Because the God that they don't believe in tends to be the distant individual, the one with the thunderbolt ready to hurl. And I say, that, that sounds like Thor. Um, I don't believe in Thor. Can I tell you about this God? Can I tell you about Christ Jesus, who is full of the Spirit, beloved of the Father, and what does he do with his godness? He stoops, serves, suffers, bleeds, and dies. This is an interesting God, don't you think? (laughs) Whatever God you might have rejected, have a look again at this Jesus, because here is a God you can trust. Here is a God who would plunge down into our pit. And you might think, well, why would he do that? Why would he plunge down into our pit? Well, you can't deny that the world is a hell of a world sometimes. You can't deny that this world is full of darkness and death and disconnection. And and you think, well, where's that come from? The Bible says we've turned from the God of light. And if you turn from light, where else do you go but darkness? We've turned from life. And when you turn from life, where else do you go but death? And we've turned from love. And when you turn from love, where else do you go but disconnection? But what does this God of life and light and love, what does he do when he sees us in a pit? He says, your pit will be my pit. Your darkness will be my darkness. Your death will be my death. Your debts will be my debts. 
So who is Jesus? He's the son of the father who stoops down, verse 7, makes himself nothing, takes the nature of a servant, or you could even say a slave. Verse 8, he's humbling himself, constantly obedient all the way to death on a cross. Because he wants to meet us at the darkest part of the valley of the shadow. And there he is. I don't know if you're in that darkest part of the valley of the shadow right now. If you're in that darkest part of that deep, dark valley, what's the truth? What's the truth that stands above you? What is history like? Do you think history is the tragic comedy? Do you think it's that waiting for God-o thing? Do you, do, you, do you think you're just stuck in this pit and nobody's coming to get you? Is that what you think? Gosh, that's a hell of an existence, isn't it? Just to be in that pit and nobody's coming for you. Or maybe you think life is a tragedy, and there you are in the pit. So what's, what's the message then? You know what the message is? Pull yourself up by your bootstraps, lad, right? Pull yourself together. Come on, climb. You can do it, right? It's not very uh, pastorally minded, is it, that kind of advice? If your friend is in a pit, is that your advice? Pull yourself together. You're, you're, you're no great pastor. You're no great friend, if that's your advice to people. What do we want to do when we see people we love in the pit? You know what we, we want to do? We want to jump down with them shoulder to shoulder and say, your pit will be my pit. Come on, I know the way out of here. Come on, let's do this together. That's what God says, okay? That, that is what God says to you in a pit. In the pit that you're in, he jumps down with you to be for you and to walk you through that valley of the shadow. This is what Jesus does. He comes to join us in our pit and he suffers even the God-forsaken curse of death on the cross. He meets us where we are. And therefore, verse 9, God exalted him to the highest place, exalted him to the right hand of the Father, that, that place of honor and blessing. And you'll notice that the beginning of this story, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. He is in the place of love and grace and blessing, and there he is in that place of authority. But he plunges down to our pit and then goes back to that place. He then goes back to the right hand of the Father. But what's different now? You know what's different now? He takes you and me with him. That's what's different. That's why he's come into the pit. He's come down to meet us, be where we are, and he's come to be our brother in strife. Our brother showing up to the fight. Our brother who lays his arm around us, lifts us, and carries us home. That's, that's who Jesus is. And we get that from that phrase, the, the right hand of the Father. You'll notice in the creed that it says, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. And I wonder if you kind of have been figuring out or trying to figure out what does that mean, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. It's, it's actually language that the Bible uses of the high priest in the Old Testament. Uh, you might know that in the Old Testament, uh, there were these people who played dress up. Okay, All the Old Testament is, is full of dress up and dramatization. That's, that's what it's all about. And the temple was at the heart of this dramatization of the Jesus story. So that for hundreds of years before Jesus comes, people were enacting and reenacting the Jesus story. And as they enacted and reenacted the Jesus story, there was one guy who played dress-ups as the high priest. His name was Aaron originally. And what he did, and you can read about this in Exodus 28 and Exodus 29, he would put on the clothing of Jesus. He, he was kind of playing dress-ups and he's saying, everybody look at me, I'm going to enact the Jesus story. And what he would do is he would dress up as the high priest and he would, how should I do this? Okay, let's, let's, let's imagine, okay, let's imagine here that there is the altar of sacrifice and then back here, here we go, back here we've got the holy place where only the priests are allowed and then way back here, am I still in focus, am I still in shot, are we good, okay, and then back here we're in the most holy place where God lives, okay, okay, the technical guys are going crazy, we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out, okay, so what does, the, what does the high priest do? The high priest goes and he makes 
the sacrifices for the sins of the people. Because he's dramatizing what Jesus will do. Jesus will come as the great sacrifice. He will come as the great Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So the sacrifices are made for our sins. And then what the high priest does is he takes the blood through the holy place all the way into the most holy place. It's the throne room of God. The very place of God's presence and power and authority. So he takes the blood of the sacrifice into the most holy place. And he says prayers. And he fills up the place with incense, which is another kind of a a demonstration of, an enactment of praying. So what were the people being taught? The people were being taught, I cannot get into God's presence unless there's a sacrifice. Because I am full of death and he is full of life. And if I come into his presence, it, it won't work. I am a snowflake. He is a consuming fire. It won't work, right? There needs to be a death. We've lived a deathly kind of life, having turned from God and tried to make things work on our own terms. We've lived that grasping life, that climbing life. The Bible calls it sin, right? We've tried to, tried to climb and scratch and grab and take. It's called sin. It's, it's not God's kind of life. And so that kind of life, when it comes into God's presence, it it becomes death. Well, good news. The high priest makes a sacrifice. There's the death of another. And then the high priest takes that sacrifice through into the most holy place, and he shows God the sacrifice, and he prays for the people. And there's one item of the high priest's clothing I need to tell you about. On his chest, he wears 12 gemstones. Do you know what the 12 gemstones represent? the 12 tribes of Israel, the people of God. Because everything that the high priest does, he does representing his people. Everything he does, he does for his people. So that as he makes the sacrifice, he's carrying you on his heart. So that as he ascends into the most holy place, he's carrying you on his heart. As he prays before the Father, he is carrying you on his heart. As he sits in that place of blessing and honor at the Father's right hand, he carries you on his heart. Isn't that good news? Because look, in the Old Testament, your relationship with God was down to your high priest. Okay, If you had a good high priest... If he did the rituals correctly, then you got into God's presence because he carried you on his heart, okay? Your relationship with God was not down to whether you've been a good boy or a bad boy today, a good girl or a bad girl this week, okay? that's That's not your status with God. Your status with God is your high priest's status. He's your representative. If you've got a good high priest, if he does all those rituals correctly, then you are carried into God's presence, And your position with the Father is as good as your high priest's position with the Father. Now, come through to the New Testament. Come through to today. What is your standing with God? Is your standing with God based on whether you've been a good boy today? Whether you've been a good girl this week? Is is that what your status with God is down to? No, your, your status with God is down to your great high priest. Your status with God is as good as Jesus's, if you're on his heart, if you're connected to him, if you are connected to him, he carries you on his heart into God's presence and there he is seated forever. There he is seated in that flow, that Niagara Falls of blessing and love at the Father's right hand. You know, when he plunged down into that pit, he did it to pick you up to put you on his shoulders and to carry you home so that now you are at the right hand of the Father, loved with the very love that both predated and produced the universe. That's your standing at the right hand of the Father. In the Creed, we read about judgment and people worry about judgment because they they worry about how they will fare on that last day. But I think the creed has such good news for us. The creed says, do you want to be on the right side of judgment? Well, be in Jesus, because he is at the right hand of the Father, the place of mercy and blessing and rest. And if you are on his heart, the only way you can go to hell is if Jesus does. And that ain't going to happen. 
Are you on your high priest's heart? Have you said to Jesus, Jesus, thank you that you made your life into my life. Thank you that you joined me in my pit. I want to make my life into your life. I want to join you in your palace. And anyone who says yes to Jesus, now we just belong to Jesus. Carried on his heart, filled by his spirit, loved by his father. It's for free and it's forever. Like, Do you want this Jesus? Do you want this high priest? Or do you want to come into God's presence without a representative, without a high priest? Do you want to come into his presence just carrying your own bundle of contradictions and selfishness and sin? Do you want to come to God like that? That's not a smart move. Especially when freely offered to you is the perfect righteousness of Jesus. The one who says, I've come down to your pit to turn it into your palace. Come and have me. He will come to judge the living and the dead. It's very good news that it's Jesus who comes to judge the living and the dead. Jesus who does that. I was once uh, speaking at a university and uh, my talk wasn't about judgment at all. Um, And yet in the question and answer session afterwards, um, somebody just sprung on me this question. They they got up and they they said, um, do you believe there will be a judgment at the end of all things? I said, yes, I do. I think it's in the Bible. I think it's, yeah. History is heading somewhere. We all believe already that history, the the, the arc of history bends towards justice. And therefore, if there's going to be justice, it means there'll be some things that are included and some things that are excluded. There there will be a judgment. Justice demands it. So yeah, I I do believe there will be a judgment. And he said to me, where do you think Anne Frank is right now? That's a good question, isn't it? Where do you think Anne Frank is? Of course, he chose Anne Frank because she was not, as far as we can tell, a a believer in Jesus. And yet she lived a a life of of goodness and and her diary has inspired millions around the world. And I think we can all resonate with Anne Frank and we can all resonate with the the evil and the harm that she suffered at the hands of the Nazis. And so our, our sympathy goes out to Anne Frank and he wanted to know. So how's it going to go for Anne Frank at the end? And I... I just said, look, my belief as a Christian is not that I know who's going up and down. That's not really my job, because he will come to judge the living and the dead. He. Isn't that good news? When you go on social media, isn't the the greatest problem in the world that you will judge the living and the dead? Isn't that the great problem? That everyone is judging everybody else. Don't you notice that? Don't you notice our, our fractured society over Brexit or in the States, the fractured society, left versus right, Republican versus Democrat. There's fractured natures everywhere because everyone is the judge. And everyone thinks they know and they're going to exclude these guys and include these guys because these guys are my guys and those guys are the bad guys. Boo hiss, right? What's the problem with that? That's saying, I will judge the living and the dead. Here is good news. He will judge the living and the dead. Jesus will judge the living and the dead. And, and I said to this student, I don't know what happens to somebody in their last moments. I really don't. But it is interesting that people talk about their life flashing before their eyes. And I I do wonder whether this is an opportunity for everyone. That the Lord is saying to everyone, do you want to take all of that and be judged on that? Or do you just want to call on the name of the Lord and be saved? You know, Do you want to represent yourself? at the judgment? Or do you want someone to represent you? Do you want the Lord himself to represent you? I I don't know what happens in those last moments with people. But there's one thing I do know about judgment. I know who the judge will be. Who will the judge be? The judge will be Jesus, a persecuted Jew. That's interesting, isn't it? The judge of all the world will be someone against whom great injustice and betrayal has happened. The judge of the whole world will be someone against whom injustice has been visited in the most horrific way. The judge of all the world knows and understands and sympathizes with Anne Frank. 
And the judge of all the world, according to Christians, is the one who took himself out of the judgment seat, placed himself in the dock, and gave himself the harshest judgment there'll ever be. So no one need ever go to hell. He's the one who will judge. And it's not my job to say who goes up and down, but the creed says, and the Bible says, he will come to judge the living and the dead, and I trust him. And when you see how he pours himself out, even for the wicked, even for me, he's the only trustworthy judge we've got. Think of all the different people who could judge you in the end. Think of all the different people. So imagine that this is a meaningless universe and death is the end for everybody. What an outrageously unjust judge. Because then Anne Frank and the person who put Anne Frank to death both get exactly the same. Isn't that outrageously unfair? Outrageously unfair. Death judges in this arbitrary and completely unfair way, right? Or imagine that, imagine that karma judges you. Imagine it's just the, the Eastern notion in which if you put bad out into the world, bad will be visited back on your head. Do you want to be judged by karma? Once again, karma is not, it is fair, but it is not a merciful judge, is it? Karma is not a merciful judge. Karma is just getting your just desserts. Of all the judges in the world, if you could elect one, and you can't, but if you could elect one, wouldn't you pick Jesus? He is the only merciful judge. And he's the only judge who actually gives you what you want. Can you imagine a judge in a trial just giving someone what they want? At the end of, at the end of all things, this is my view of judgment. At the end of all things, God hands you over to what you have wanted. If you have not wanted him, then you don't get him. If you have wanted him, then you get him. What an extraordinarily gracious judge. Have you ever heard of a judge who gives to the convicted criminal exactly what they want? This is the nature of judgment. And there are all sorts of questions I don't know the answer to when it comes to this. But one thing I do know is that he will come to judge the living and the dead. He will come. And notice it at the end of Philippians, verse 9, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. At the end, we will all acknowledge Jesus. We will, we will all say that he is Lord. But the issue is, if you are committed to living the tragedy... If you're committed to climbing up on the hill and being on top, and if you're committed to saying no to Jesus, then for him to be Lord and for you to bow will be hell. It'll, it'll, it'll be hell to bow. If you're committed to Jesus not being Lord, and if you're committed to climbing up in the world, then bowing, it'll be hell for you. It will. But, but, if you embrace the comedy if you love Jesus the Lord, then to confess him as Lord and to bow down, that will be heaven for you. But it's the same thing. It's the same goodness of Jesus. It's the same self-giving love offered to the world that produces two different responses in people. It's not that Jesus is nice to some and nasty to others. It's not that at all. Jesus is only good. He is only light and life and love. And if you will receive that light and life and love, that will be the sunshine of his love. But if you do not want him, and the Gospels tell us many times when Jesus shines so brightly, people just actually prefer the darkness, prefer to be lost. It's not because Jesus is unkind. It's not because Jesus is not full of light and life and love. It's that people have not wanted that light and life and love. But the Bible says light and life and love will have the victory. It will have the victory because he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you want this Jesus? If you do want this Jesus, then there's two things that, that all of us need to do. The Bible talks about repenting and believing. <coughs> repenting and believing. And it's something that both Christians and non-Christians need to do. All of humanity needs to do this thing. Repenting means turning around. It's literally what the word means. You turn around, okay? So that means we had been living the tragic life, right? We had been trying to climb and grab and scratch and take and get. 
that's, that, that's the natural human condition. That's my human heart. I'm, I'm always waking up trying to think, what can I get out of today? How can I take? How can I grasp? And the Bible says, no, repent. That's the frown, right? Turn that frown upside down, okay? Instead, embrace the comedy. You know what the comedy is? The, co- the comedy is with Jesus and in Jesus and by his Spirit, pour yourself out. Serve, sacrifice, suffer for the sake of others. Put your arm around others in the pit. Walk with them through that dark valley, knowing that it is Jesus ultimately who is your good shepherd. That's the, that's the comedy. You know, sometimes when people hear about becoming a Christian, they think, oh, it sounds, it sounds amazing, becoming a Christian. And then it sounds like bad news because Christians then say, oh, yeah, and you've got to live a life of service now. Right? It's, oh, man, I should have checked the fine print. You know, It sounded great, all this light and life and love, and now you're telling me I've got to... I've got to live a life of service. And Christians at that point say, no, no, it's not that you have to live a life of service. You get to. You actually get to. You actually get to live the comedy. But the comedy is not laugh a minute. The comedy is going down in order to be raised up. The comedy is living the life of Christ, the life of self-giving love. It's not something you have to do. It's something you get to do now. So repent. Stop living the grasping life. And Christians need to do this. And those who are not yet Christians need to do this. We all need to do this. We need to repent of that grasping life. I need to repent of it today. And maybe there are people here who need to repent of it for the first time. You've realized, you know, I'm, I'm actually living the tragic life. I'm just climbing to the top of the compost heap. That's, that's no way to live. You need to repent of the tragedy. Embrace the comedy. So you need to repent and believe. What should we believe? Well, we should believe that Jesus is Lord. That's how our passage begins and ends. He is the Lord. And when you see him come, stoop, serve, suffer, bleed, and die for you, how can you deny that this, this must be what God is like, right? When you look at Jesus, I remember that's, that's how I became a Christian. I was reading through the Gospels, and I thought to myself, whoever God is... He's got to be this guy, right? This Jesus guy who is continually sacrificing and serving and suffering for others with his arms outstretched, bleeding for his enemies. Surely this is Lord, don't you think? Don't you think he's Lord? And if you think he's Lord, then you know what happens? He becomes your high priest. He becomes your Aaron. He becomes the the person who picks you up in the pit who brings you to his own heart, carries you into the Father's presence. Do you believe that? Do you believe that today? Do you believe that it's not just Jesus who is at the right hand of the Father? You are. You know, your prayer life, how how do you consider your prayer life? Whether you're a Christian or not, I bet you've prayed at some point. And so often we we just feel like our prayers bounce off the ceiling. So we yell a little bit louder. We try to get our prayers to ascend to heaven. You don't need your prayers to ascend to heaven. Jesus has ascended to heaven. Your high priest is at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you now. That means praying for you now. You can read through Hebrews and you'll you'll learn. He is praying for you now. You're not yelling up to heaven. You're whispering in his ear. And how does God feel about you today? You who are connected to Jesus. How how does God feel about you? He feels about you the same way he feels about his most beloved son. Remember that verdict that the father gave at the baptism? You are my son who I love. With you I am well pleased. You know who God says that to? He says it to you. You are beloved. You are in on that Niagara Falls of blessing. Do you believe it? Do you believe in your Lord? who became your high priest and who carried you home? If so, we flow out into the world. We flow out into this week, renouncing the tragedy, embracing the comedy, because history really does bend towards justice. It really does bend towards light and life and love because history is his story. Should we pray? Let me pray for us.
Lord Jesus. We thank you that you are the one who met us in our darkness. Lord Jesus, if there are any who have not yet called you Lord from the depths of their hearts, I pray that now, right now, they would call on you as Lord. May we live and walk and speak knowing that the arc of history does bend towards justice. It bends towards your glorious new creation life. So Lord Jesus, fill us with faith and hope and love. Amen.